Good morning. Good morning. I think everything's working today. Good to see you guys on Facebook or you be seen, be seen by you on Facebook, uh, Facebook Live and Zoom. Um, uh, Rachel's not here this morning, but she saved us last week. She used the iPad and came down here and uh, that was that was great how we adjusted and glad to see all of you here this morning. <clears throat> We're in the midst of transitions and challenges in our world and it's good to find an oasis. We may have been emotional camels. You know how camels can go so long without water. <clears throat> we may have been emotional camels where we've been going through some hard times. It's been using up our emotional and spiritual resources. But I would just like to say I'm glad we're getting close to an oasis. It might feel a little more normal. And I'm really glad of that. I like seeing people's faces all the time. And uh, I'm a hugger uh, to some people's chagrin, chagrin but, uh, but uh, I love hugging. I'm, I love to get back to doing all that. And I'm glad that we're here this morning in the life and the love of God and glad that we can be together. Let's share our welcome this morning. Welcome, all who are here. Welcome. Welcome, my physical, mental, and spiritual self to this moment. Welcome. Welcome, spirit of the risen Christ among us. Welcome. Together, we willingly enter communion one with another. Welcome. Sing this is the day. things wrenching and hard God God holds the tender tender care. Care. you and I neighbors and strangers friends and enemies God God loves without condition. Without condition. let us let love us our, our friends enemies and enemies like, like Jesus Christ. Christ let's share our hymn of praise praise of the Lord the Almighty
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we meet here in the midst of our lives, each of us, all of us, this world, your creation. We come here to praise because it's easy to get caught up in our world, in our lives, and in this creation. You taken over by the insecurities and anxieties, the questions, the unknowns that are part of our living, and forget what we know by faith, that get ourselves far away from, distracted from, perhaps even working against the reality that you love us, the reality that you sustain our world, the fact that no matter where we go, you are there. The fact that no matter what we do, your grace is sufficient. So help us in this time to offer praises to you. Praises to you within your grace. Praises to you because of your grace. Praises to you while we are sustained by your love. Praises to you so that we might be transformed by your love from the people we are today to the people you've made us to be. Help us to be your people and to be faithful and to become not only the voicers of, the ones who speak the words of a prayer, but the ones who become the fulfillment of the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Well, the story I had for the children today. Y'all want to hear the story I have for the children today? Okay, good. In April of 1972, uh, and I've probably told the story once before, but in April of 72, my dad was in Vietnam for the second time. We had gone a few weeks without a letter, and uh, I'd already had friends who got the visit from the chaplain with the letter from the president. And I was scared my dad might be dead. My mom was having what turned out to be some female problems that they didn't explain to an eighth grader. Just my mom was emotionally erratic, let's say. I was not close to my mom at that time. She was trying to be mom and dad. And then uh, my best friend was over, Craig Benedict. I was playing the guitar my dad had got on leave. He had gotten a break while in Vietnam. He had gone to Japan for some R&R &R, and he bought and shipped me a guitar. And I was playing that guitar and I put it down to go get some uh, Fritos and Dr. Pepper. Um, that was my favorite snack if mom wasn't in the mood for frying chicken livers. But anyway, um, I came back in, uh, Craig, we were listening to Grand Funk Railroad. This is what puts the time on it. Um, and Craig was sitting there with my, my guitar on his lap and he was tapping the guitar with drumstick. He wasn't beating on it, like, but he was tapping on it. And I was so afraid. I just, I really, I beat him up. He was he was uh, bleeding from the nose and the mouth when he left my house. I said, don't you touch my guitar again. It was the loneliest moment of my life. I didn't know what to do except what my grandma had told me to do. She said, when you get really desperate, call out to God. God will always show up. So I called out to God on my knees in my aunt's house in Longview, Texas, alienated from my best friend and my mother. And thinking my dad might be dead and God showed up. I had peace. It was a peace that passed understanding. My mom told me after I went back and apologized to her for all the hot, hateful things I had said and thought. 
She said, I need to apologize to Craig for beating him up. <laughs> she was right, so I walked across the street to apologize to Craig. I didn't know if he'd forgive me. He didn't really, he didn't deserve what he got at all. I walked into his room. I said, Craig, I'm really sorry. He said, that's okay, let's play ball. That's okay, let's play ball. No matter how old you are, you're gonna wonder sometimes if God will love you, the answer is yes. You're gonna wonder if anybody else can love you. To whatever degree anybody else in your life has their life in harmony with the love of God, the answer is yes. People who have their life in harmony with the love of God will forgive you. That's what we do. Because that's what our Lord does. Amen. Let's go now to our time of prayer. I have a few um, things I'd like to update us on. One is we want to pray for the family of Larry Burke, a uh, cousin of Michelle Brown. Praying for them. He passed away this week. Praying for the Burke family. Also, Philip uh, Miller, who is the brother in law to Theresa Henderson, he had a heart attack. It was confirmed, and he's right now in heart catheterization, and they'll be deciding what to do surgery, stent, whatever. Uh, so be praying for Philip, if you will. Barbara Jennings, got an update from her. Her leg is slowly improving. She says, I think I can tell it's better each day. Um, she's still waiting on he enough healing and capacity within the surgical unit to do the surgery she needs to have full healing on her leg. I continue to admire her perseverance. Uh, she's had so many reasons to be discouraged, but she's getting better. Heather Hilliard, um, who's uh, part of our church, uh, she and her husband, Craig, are up where he's stationed in uh, Staten Island at the Coast Guard Station there. She's uh, getting a cardiac diagnosis and they'll wear the monitor and then they'll evaluate and the we'll be praying for Heather. And then we want to be praying for Cree Campbell and everyone around Cree. Cree has been uh, assigned to hospice. She's uh, right at the end of this wonderful journey she's been on an adventure. Um, I can say two things. One is I, I've already had a few good cries about Cree dying she's just one of my mamas you understand she's old enough to be my mom you understand and 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 she's one of mine and so it's it's a uh, i've had been here long enough to, to attach and it'll be the same with you guys because i if if we if you go first um but the other thing is she has a support system around her if you're wondering what is the payoff for loving your family well and teaching them to love one another well then i suggest you pay attention We'll be praying for Cree as she goes through this last part of her life with us. And then uh, she dwells in the perfect place and we join her when it's our turn to join. Are there other updates or additions to the list? Any on Zoom or here in the sanctuary? All right. All right. Thank you, Melanie. Melanie's just calling us to pray for the uh, people who have suffered violence. We see it so much in the news now. Praying for everyone, not only the victims of violence, but the families around them. Um, and even I've known a couple of cases where the people who were the perpetrators, their family was in huge crisis, not understanding where the violence came from. So be praying for, for them. Thank you, Melanie. Yeah, Ben.
Yeah, sure. I will. We're going to pray for Jeffrey Murphy and his wife, Jen. Yeah. And uh, uh, he participates in our Bible study and comes to worship some. We pray for him. His wife had a fall, uh, was injured, and we want to pray for her not only healing, but uh, for all the anxiety. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, see. Yeah. Yeah, I've been watching that. The um, Steve was asking us to pray for the families down east around the plane crash for the teenagers and parents. The whole community. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Anybody else? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Have a time of silence where you can pray as the Spirit leads you, and then I'll close this with prayer. Pray. Lord, we thank you that you take the burdens of our hearts and remind us that you share them with us. We thank you that you take the sins and our confession, forgive them, and show up again fresh and new, ready to be in our lives again. We thank you that when we offer you the concerns for people and the places and the stresses and the grief that are going on in our world, we can trust you to be moving in those situations and that you will let us know when it is ours to move to enter into those people's lives and offer them the grace and the compassion and the support and the resources that they need. Help us to not only lift prayers to you, but to make those prayers the context of each place where we encounter your spirit and are not only directed to release our concerns and worries to you, where we are to put our feet in our hands to the answers to prayers and the meeting of needs. So help us to do that. Hear our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, as we take communion, I want to remind you or tell you for the first time, if you're fresh with us on Facebook or Zoom, that we invite all of you to find something that can be your bread and your cup, and you join us in communion. In addition to any way the Holy Spirit might invite you to take part in communion and experience the love and the grace of Christ today, I would like you to remember that the reason, one of the reasons we come back together and have communion each time and in our tradition, one of the ways we say Christians have gathered is when they share communion. But we meet in our tradition to share communion together, which is not only the act of sharing the bread and the cup, 
but the reality that we are in communion in Christ. I want to remind you that one reason, and it's really good news that we come back, is that between each time we come back, we fail and we need forgiven. And guess what? We're forgiven. Between every time we take communion, we may have grown a little or become aware of a huge amount of growth that we need. Today's passage is one of the most challenging passages uh, in the preaching of Jesus Christ. It gets to the core of what the bread and the cup mean. It gets to the core of what it means to be Christian as opposed to anyone else and any other identity in the world. And so I ask that we would just consider that we take a big deep breath as we share the bread and the cup and be reminded that the love and grace of God is sufficient and God is continuing to help us grow up into the fullness of Christ in our lives. May it be so. Let's share our hymn of communion. Be known to us in breaking bread. Thank you for this opportunity to come and share bread in memory and honor of you. Lord, as we take this bread, help us to focus on the fact that we need to love more, love you more, and love others, at least as much as ourselves, and even our enemies. We pray in Christ. Holy name of Jesus, your son, our Savior. After he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Take it. Creator of all life lover of mankind, we come to the table as humbly and beyond our comprehension how great your love is for us. And that you would come as a human, that Jesus would come and walk the earth and show us how to walk, show us how to love, and would call us to be reminded of his great love for us. Thank you, God. As we leave this place today, let our May we, throughout the week, with each breath, may we inhale, as we inhale, may we be reminded of your great love for us. And as we exhale, oh God, may we love our other people around us, love mankind, love our neighbor as ourselves. May we be known for your great love. In Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. In the same way, he took the cup, he blessed it, and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. It's now that we remember the gift of God, gift of life, all of our lives, everything we have. It's also the time when we acknowledge, say thank you. God by giving our gifts and say thank you to one another in the sharing of our gifts 
For as we support this church and the work of Christ around the world, we keep in place where you can come and share the bread, where you can come and hear the message of the good news of Jesus Christ, and where others who have not yet heard and known and trusted can be brought into that love. May we give according to the glory of God and for the sake of the good news of Christ. Amen. Let's sing our doxology. Good morning. This morning we'll be reading Luke chapter 6 verses 27 through 38 and I'm reading from the New King James Version. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, Offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Amen. <laughs>
Well, the sermon hen preached the sermon, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. Today I'd like to talk about, as we continue to look at how to be a Christian today, I'd like to talk about the fact that as I understood God's Spirit speaking to me, he was saying, George, you love your enemies like Jesus Christ. We'll get to that at the end of the sermon. But it is important for us to recognize that we have been instructed, just as Virginia has read, by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to love our enemies as well as our friends. Just remember that in Luke 4, when Jesus came to his people, his family, his home synagogue, he read a prophetic voice, the prophetic voice of Isaiah, saying that he talking about good news for the poor, talking about freedom to prisoners, talking about sight for the blind, freedom for the oppressed, and the year of the Lord's favor. And I would just like to say that as that far along in the story, Jesus is doing pretty good. His family, friends, everybody sitting around the synagogue was like, yeah, we like that. That's really good. Good news for poor, freedom of prisoners, sight for the blind. Then he tells a story. And what he tells the story of is how a pagan is blessed. And that became a problem. He actually said that God's will is done and God's blessings go to the people who are on the outside. So now the good news to the poor could be poor foreigners. You understand? Good news, freedom to the prisoners could be people we put in jail in, intentionally. We put them in jail. And now you're telling us to love them. You understand that sight for the blind could not only be sight for the blind physically, but he does say poignantly in the Gospels, if you remember, that he's talking about spiritual blindness and he's talking to the people who led his religious tradition. They were spiritually blind. And oppressed, freeing the oppressed, he's talking about people like his family. Remember, Jesus came from the bottom up. He was a peasant family member and he was rising to be Lord of all, under whose name every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, but he didn't hold anything high as something to hold on to and grasp, but he emptied himself and became the servant. Jesus demonstrates and we replicate. Jesus initiates and we implement what he precisely says to his home church, who then took him out and wanted to kill him. And I would just like to say, everyone who's like that home church that Jesus found, everyone who's in the power systems as they are, who think that things are going pretty well for us right now, and the right people are in jail and the right people suffer, and everything's just the way it ought to be, when Jesus comes along and says something like this audacious thing, Virginia just read, oh, yeah. you hear that and you just like, So let's talk about it. First off, I want to ask the question, who was being loved on the cross of Christ? I think we agree. Jesus is hanging there. And it's, it's the perfect, complete place in which the love of God is demonstrated. He's hanging on the cross. Who is that for? Some people think there's a group it's for and a group it's not for. But others of us think it was for everybody, and we decide how much we cooperate and enjoy the fact that we are forgiven. Who is it for? I would just like to remind you that when he was born, the whole universe announced his birth. Would the whole universe announce the birth of someone who was going to exclude a big part of the universe? You remember the star, right? You remember the magi who weren't locals? You remember who got to know first? This peasant couple who birthed, who became parents to Christ. This, these peasant uh, shepherds on a hillside. And remember, shepherds were more like sailors than they were respected uh, businessmen. And then he forms this ecclesi ecclesia, this ecclesia, this church, this body of people who are on the forefront of implementing and bringing about the kingdom of God. And turns out most of them are rejected poor people. And a few rich people who fund things, but that's because those rich end up being the camels that go through the eye of the needle. Because Jesus is really clear when you're on the hot, when you're on the top side of things, 
you're like a camel trying to go through the eye of a needle. You'll tend to hold on to everything you got, and you're not going to get through the eye of the needle. But turns out, in the early church, there were a few rich people who got it. Maybe they were related to some peasants who were suffering, and they decided not to let that continue. I don't know, but they did. Remember, Jesus said the kingdom of God is near, right here. And Jesus is walking in the earth, and what we're saying is there's the Christ. So who did the Christ come for, and who was Jesus loving on the cross? He's hanging there on the cross. I just want you to know that if Jesus was hanging on the cross and what he was saying to his people, to the religious leaders in Jerusalem and to the Roman world, here, what you need to do is get me killed because if you get me killed, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you in power. Or if he had said, here's the nature of my kingdom. Uh, and instead of riding a donkey into town, he rides a stallion in town and he forms an army and he kicks all the Romans out. If he had done that, he wouldn't have got crucified. Do you understand? They'd have been, we understand your kingdom. Let's do that. You make us the winner, we'll make you the king. And every time he did a lot of good and they wanted to make him king, it says he escaped them because they were wanting to make him a king in light of blessing and good things and accumulation of food and wealth and everything. And he was not going to be that kind of Messiah. Who was being loved on the cross of Christ? Every single one of them. I want you to let it sink in. It has to keep sinking in for me. I don't know if you have any self-loathing in your, in your thoughts. I don't know if you ever think you're really messed up and you've got a long way to go. That happens a lot in my head. I'm like in light of everything you know, George, you ought to be a lot further along than you, than you think you should, than you are. And I just sit there and I think, well, here we are. Here we are again, Lord. I recently went back and I've been reading my past journals. And I hate the fact that some of those themes in my journals are the same as the ones I'm writing now. <laughs> like, what in the world? Get over this. Come on. But that's the way it is. Perhaps he's talking to the 20% of Americans that suffer with clinical depression and anxiety. Perhaps he's talking to the people who are struggling with addictions, who are as Melanie reminded us, the victims of or the perpetrators of violence. I just wonder who he died for, and I want us to let it sink in. Every single person we know. Now, second question is, who loves like Christ? Christ is there. Turn the other cheek. Did he turn the other cheek? The answer to all these questions. Yes. Did he turn the other cheek? Yes. He hung there on the cross and he was like, if you strip me naked, beat me and hang me up and mock me while I die, I'm still going to love you. No matter what you do, I'm going to meet your choice to inflict punishment on me with my soul force to forgive you. And you can't win. I win. Because even if you crucify me and put me in a grave, I'm going to walk in and say, you're still me. Right here. Peter, you know how you denied me three times and I told you it was coming and you still weren't listening. Remember that? Welcome. Feed my sheep. Now you understand there is a barter system. There is a give and take. We understand that. I think it's, I think it's only acceptable that if I work as a professional minister, or I work in my other full-time job, that I get paid. Y'all think out of anybody running a grudge getting paid for your work? No, I don't think it's paid. You understand? He's not, Jesus is not saying don't participate in that rational system of give and take. What he's saying is, I'm going to put you in a whole nother level of give and take. And in that level of give and take, it becomes clear who Jesus died for. It becomes clear the nature of God's love. But this system doesn't tell you about God's love. The system tells you about give and take, eye for an eye, tooth, tooth for tooth. See, it, that's the way it is. But I want to tell you about the love that's way better than that. In fact, this world degenerates, this give and take world degenerates into wars and winning wars and losing wars. And in that world, you will always have wars and rumors of wars. But when this other level happens, whoo! And who loves like that? It only 
happens with the people who identify with the one who loves like that. If you are not fully identified with Jesus Christ, you will not love like Jesus Christ. In fact, he starts out this passage, as Virginia read it. Those of you who, who are listening, those of you who have ears, and the question comes, who has ears? Well, I would just like to say we just took communion, the bread and the cup. We're all sitting here with ears. We have all said we are going to come here and rearrange our lives and orient our lives to Jesus Christ. We're going to live our lives in Jesus Christ and as an expression of Jesus Christ. We took the bread and the cup, and we weren't lying. We're telling the truth. We have come here to listen. That's when it's possible. And if it's not, then it's just a heavy burden. You want to know what a heavy burden is? It's when somebody tells you to do something you can't do. I remember one time the right guard didn't show up for practice at football, and, and we were running the, uh, the first team offense, and I mean second team offense against first team defense, and defensive guard hadn't got to practice. I don't remember if he showed up later or not. But I was five foot six and 135 pounds. And coach said, why don't you fill in for uh, Matt, their door on right guard? And I, I said, really? Like, you really want me to get down in front of Julius Green, who plays guard for us? Julius Green? Really? Julius Green, yeah, do the best you can. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll do that. Well, I just want you to say it proved to be a foolish choice on both of our parts. Uh, I was hurting after two plays. I was like, please. Please find another alternative to put me there. And Julius Green was laughing. Come on, Fuller, do it again. Get down here. Come on. <clears throat> Love your enemies? Sure. Yeah. You can't do it. I don't know if, if you remember, but I grew up with Don Lane. I like the way he handled things. I remember in Sons of Katie Elder, that bad, bad guy was threatening his brother. He walked into that uh, corral and looked at the guy and said, if you mess with my brother again, I'll kill you. And the guy said, yeah, that sounds like a threat. And John Lane said, that's not a threat. That's a fact. <laughs> I like that. I like the, the show Equalizer. I haven't watched the new one much. The old one, I love it. I love it when, when bad guys get face off with say, if you If you're going to keep doing that, it's going to go good for you. And I have to tell you that the Hebrew scriptures really wrestled with keeping that as the standard. One of the problems that our tradition has had is what do you do with the Hebrew scriptures who have God doing vengeance when Jesus not doing vengeance? Some of the people in our tradition don't even pay much attention to the Old Testament. In fact, a couple of them said we don't need to spend time teaching the Old Testament because Jesus fulfilled it, changed it. We have a new covenant, not the old covenant. And it's interesting how many people who justify violence in the name of Jesus quote more of the Old Testament than the New. They live before Christ in their social and political decisions, and after Christ in their, I'm going to go to heaven when we part of their lives. Jesus is saying, no, we live out of the Old Covenant now. The kingdom of God is when? Now. Nah. Who loves like Christ? It's the ones who want to be like their father who's merciful. If not, you'll be like your father who's not merciful. Who, who's going to love like Christ? The ones who have made Jesus Lord and want to be just like their Lord. Who won't? The people who have not made him Lord and do not want to be like their Lord. Now, that may make it sound like you're going to do it. No. No. I'm going to get to that at the end, but no. My experience is not. I decided to love my enemies, prayed to Jesus, and now I always do it. That is not my experience. What I have had the experience of is the truth of this passage, and that is like the people who will listen to this, who have ears, as it said, who have this put in their lap, as it said, who receive it, are the ones who have decided to make Jesus Lord of their life. We have all these images of violence, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Plenty of people now who, in the name of Jesus, uh, call us to violence, and I would just like to say that is not true. Calling people the violence in the name of Jesus is inaccurate. It is an old covenant understanding of Christ, and it's false. Can it, you want me to be clearer? It is false. Every time violence is used in the name of Christ, it is 
false. Do we have a world where the false versions of Christ exist? Yes. Do they exist inside of George Fuller? Yes. You understand? I'm not saying I don't have that instinct that I don't love the sons of Katie L. Moon. I'm not saying I don't love equal love. I'm not saying that I don't once in a while think it's safe, but I'll get to that more in a minute. I think what we're asking is who loves like Christ? And the answer is those who are ready to try. Those who have decided, I've lived my whole life with this system as Lord of my life. I now want to begin to live my life and live it in harmony with this new system of Jesus Christ. You're ready to experiment. You're ready to learn. You're ready to trust. You're ready to cooperate. You're ready to encourage each other to be in a group of people like us who come together weekly and get together and say, this is the bread and the cup. And we understand what the bread and the cup means in terms of the love of God. And we want to do that. Not settle for the old cup. Not settle for this give and take. And I'm not saying we shouldn't include give and take. I want you to write me the check twice a month. Understand? I'm not saying I don't want that level that I'm not going to participate in. I do not aspire for that to be the highest level of love I ever had. I don't want Tammy to think I only love her when she pleases me in the way she relates to me. I don't want you to think you have to be the church that I think the perfect church ought to be for me to love being your pastor. We will be with each other as we are so that we can become what we can become. And the next question is, will we seek the reward of being Christian? The real question is, what reward are we going to seek? Will we seek the reward of being Christian, or will we seek the rewards of that other lower level of give and take? It's a real question for George. It's a real question for each of you, I would suggest. <clears throat> and I don't think we can really understand that till we understand we're all in one fabric of mutuality. We're all in one network of mutual love. We're all in one reality that God inhabits. And that is where the rewards take place that are eternal rewards. That the rewards in which you give in that system, when I get my paycheck twice a month, when Teresa writes it and I deposit it, by the end of that month, I'm just wanting to tell you that reward's gone. You understand what I'm saying? And then I work another month. And you know what y'all do? Pay me for the month I work. I would just like to say thank you. That's the way it's supposed to work. And I agree. And I think. As my experience, I work, I work for that. I, I pay attention, and I, I'm faithful. I'm trying to do a good job of that. What we're talking about is will we seek the reward of Christ? Let's just read it again. Verses 35, 36. Let's see. We're, we're, let's see. 35 and 36. Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full, but love your enemies, do good to them that lend you, to them without expecting anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he will be kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Will we seek the rewards of, what God, of God's rewards, or will we seek the world? rewards of that other this lower level what we want is the rewards of agape not the rewards of Salea. i've talked about it before but there is a love it's a real love friendship it's mutual it's i love you you love me i lend to you i pay you back you lend to me i pay you back i do for you you do for me if i buy you a birthday present then yeah. you understand we're, we're in that world right oh that's all right but what we're talking about is agape. So Jesus is saying, you want ill for me? I'm still going to love you. you. You hurt me? I'm still going to love you. You nail me to a cross? I'm still going to love you. You can't stop it because I'm choosing agape. And I would like to point out, he did not say like everybody. In fact, some of the places I'm most sure the love of God directs my relationship with the people I don't like. You understand? And, it, and I have seen my life change and other people's lives change the most when we began at odds and came to know and love each other. And it did not mean that they stopped pulling to the University of Texas. You understand? 
That's not what it meant. That's not what it is. That's not what it meant. And it didn't mean they started doing other things that I might agree, might agree or disagree. With. And so we have to understand that inside of Christ, inside of this understanding, we are in the position of power, but we're in the position of power because we are rewarded and sustained by God, not by the work the system of power that is in the world. So are you rewarded when your children know you love them? Even when they're nasty? If you're rewarded by that, then welcome to understanding this scripture. Are you rewarded when you stop judging somebody and feel the release and freedom of grace? Are you rewarded when people forgive you? Welcome to understanding this commandment. Are you rewarded by experiencing total forgiveness both directions? Welcome to understanding this path. The position of power. We have an abundance in faith so that we can learn to rearrange this world and our relationships to experience the abundance that is in fact. There is in fact enough at this point in the earth's life to sustain all humanity with dignity. If we keep polluting the earth, and oh, I think Siri was looking something up for me. I did do not disturb till we till I leave. It's our... <laughs> Technology. So we're we're in a place where we we can rearrange the resources of the world and actually enjoy. The abundance. If we don't, what, we're, what's going to happen is the capacity of the earth to produce as much that humans need to live will decrease. It is decreasing. If it gets to a point, we may have not enough. But at this point in history, if we rearrange the way we understand and share resources, the way we understand and relate to passing power and resources around, we could actually live in harmony with each other and in the earth. If Jesus gets his way, we'll survive. If Jesus doesn't get his way, Fewer of us will serve. We must resist evil as surely as we go along with the good. So I am not talking about being abused without taking a stand. I'm not talking about being abused without seeking a freedom from your abuse. I have and will, at any point needed, help people leave abusive situations because that is not the will of God to stay in abuse Jesus was not being abused on the cross. He was, re he was receiving the consequence of being himself inside of Rome as it was and inside of Judaism as it was. His version of love was being rejected. He said, if you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. What he's saying in this passage is you can live and live in a different system. Are you rewarded by who you are and who you become? You'll understand this path. Because if you become more of the give and take power systems, then that's who you'll be. And I'll say you'll get your reward, as Jesus said. You'll have your reward in that. Free so right to check twice a month, Lord. Just do your job. Say what they like, though. Say everything the church likes because you need the money. Because you're not really dependent on God, you're dependent on money. So don't say what they might not like. You understand that happens in my head? And so, what if someone said, We will meet your physical force with our soul force? What if someone said, Do as you will, and we will still love you? Put us in jail. We'll take on humble smile, love you. Beat us, and we'll still love you. Threaten our children, burn our homes, we'll still love you. Claim we're not fit morally or culturally to participate fully in this nation, and we're still going to love you. When people say that, they're going to win. They're going to win freedom, and they're going to win freedom for the folks who are, uh, uh, abuse them. You do understand that there were many Jews. In fact, the early church was mostly Jews who came to believe Jesus was Messiah. 
So him dying on the cross and taking that from them not only brought them to God, but began to shift the world through the early church. And that's where we want to be today. And finally, the invitation to know and share the love of Christ is open. We can be Christian right now. Now, I'm going to confess that you may, if you follow me around, you may, if you listen to all the words I say and look at all the actions I take, and I know if you listen to all the thoughts going on in my head, you're going to hear George be judgmental. Because I still got that stuff in my head. You're going to hear George be bigoted. Because there's still that stuff in my head. I did not take communion to settle for that stuff. I took communion because I refused to let that keep me trapped. I have to be here. I have to take the bread. I have to take the bread. I'm out. I know the law. All 613. I don't have them memorized. But the Deuteronomical law and the Levitical law, I studied it. I had to list them out. I had to put it in a test. And I don't match up. I don't even own a goat to give to the right person. At the right time. We're acting as we are. We're acting confused, and we're a mix of when we're in harmony with this, these biddings and this, this commandment, and when we're not. That's the way we live. But we're asking about the direction of the destiny of our life, the people that we're going to go with, the people we're going to cross over the Red Sea again with, the people we're going to cross over into the kingdom of God with and build the kingdom of God with. We're right here together. We're right here with the word church Christ around the world taking communion. <clears throat> I'm paying attention to time. I hope y'all are okay if I tell one more story. Have y'all watched the movie City Slickers? If you if you hadn't watched it, I'd say it's an old, it's an old movie. I think it's in the nineties. But anyway, uh, three three good friends. And so let me just uh, I wrote their names down so I get the names right. Um, Mitch, Phil, and Ed. Mitch, Phil, and Ed. One of the things they do is they go off to this. Uh, uh, dude ranch and they they're trying to find themselves and get back together and get their lives right so they're at this dude ranch and they're herding cattle they're riding along on their horses and they've been getting to know each other and having some bonding moments one of them says what was the best day of your life and mitch says i'll go first and he tells a story about his dad taking him to see to the see a new york yankees game and smell the grass sharing a hot dog with his dad and having this great marriage, best day of life. What's your worst day? He talks about a cancer scare for his wife. His two friends were like, we didn't know she had that. Well, she went in for a biopsy. By the end of the day, we found out it wasn't nothing. But during the day, it was just the worst day of my life thinking about her being born. Bill said, well, I'll go next. What's your best day? Said, the best day of my life was my wedding day. Well, he's divorced. And he, he and his wife, his wife's being terrible to him all the time. And he says, best day of my life is my wedding. And he said, best day of your life? He said, yeah, I realized I was a man. I'd grown up. My dad was sitting there proud. Everybody was there. It was just the best day of my life. And they said, what's the worst day of your life? He said, well, the worst day of my life is every day since is a tie. <laughs> and then Ed says, I don't want to do this. I don't want to play this. Game. They wait for a little while, and he says, okay, best day of my life. My mama caught my dad cheating again. This time, the girl came by to pick him up at the house. And I realized he wasn't good for us. And he wasn't going to be good for us. So I looked him in the eye, and I told him to get out and never come back. That I'd take care of my mom and my sister. He lifted his hand and was about to hit me. And I stood in my ground. And I looked him in the eye. He dropped his hand, and he went out, and he never came back. And I did what was needed. My mom and my sister were okay now. Best day of my life. What was, what was the worst day of your life? Same day. Jesus was hanging on the cross. He was taking a stand and he was turning the other cheek. 
He was saying, I refuse to cooperate with the immoral behavior of my religious community and my political community. I will not do it. And I love you. I'm going to do what needs to be needed, and I'm going to call the people to do what needs to be needed to make this world work. It is the best day and the worst day. The passage that Virginia read, I think is the best news I've ever heard when I need forgiveness. What did I do? Is it forgivable? Thank you, Virginia. You read it? Yes, the answer is yes. I'm the enemy of Christ. So I just want to find, end by saying, you love, you love your enemies like Jesus Christ. If you can't love your enemies, it's because you haven't loved Jesus you love your enemies, it's because you love Jesus. If you're learning to love Christ, you are learning to love your enemies. If you are not learning and molding yourself to Christ, you are not learning and loving yourself, molding yourself to love your enemies. And the world needs a whole army of people who are showing the way to the cross where all the enemies of God are loved, all the friends. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love that never ends. But be with us. We struggle with this passage, at least I, I do, and everybody I get to know well does. So help us to refresh ourselves and receive your love and grace described in this passage. And help us learn, grow up, mature. Just experiment and work and be better and depend on you more and more so that we can be the ones who love our enemies. We will not cooperate with evil but we will also will not commit evil trying to overcome. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Let's sing our hymn of commitment. Help us accept each other. 487.
remind you that the love and life of God is within you. Offer your hand to the world. Now go and tell them the good news of Christ. Tell them that they're loved. And tell them not only with your words, but with your life. The glory of Christ. Amen. <laughs> couple of announcements, uh, Bible study and devotion uh, this Wednesday, 7.30 for the devotion, uh, 10.30 for Bible study. Beginning the next Wednesday, we start Lent with Ash Wednesday, and the devotion will be moved to 12.15, so that people can fit it into their day, and we'll be doing it at 12.15 all through Lent um, on Zoom um, and Facebook Live. And also, um, the... Um, there's a devotional book in the back called Steadfast Love. I would, really would like for all of you to have one. Devotions are very small. There's a quote from Henry Nowen and a passage. Yep, Melanie has a copy of it. They're back there. I've ordered enough for you to have them and take them to friends. So invite anybody you would like to, to take part in Lent. The theme for this Lent is to, to trust the steadfast love of God. Everything Christ goes through as we review uh, Lent. Everything he's going through, he's going through for the love of us, for, our love, for loving us. So I hope that you'll take part in that. And also, um, we're going to be uh, hosting and leading the Easter sunrise service at the city park this year. And you'll be hearing more about that as we get again. Was there any other announcements that we need to make? Danielle? Do what? Oh, yes. Yeah, so sorry. I was really looking forward to it. And we're going to do... Uh, Pancake and link sausage on Tuesday, a week from Tuesday, on um, Fat Tuesday or Shrove Tuesday, depending on what you want to call it. And um, so we're going to spread out. We'll spread out in the Fellowship Hall and outside. Hope it's warm enough. We can just get outside and have a good time. We'll share some music and fun. Do what? March 1st, exactly. Uh, we're going to start eating at 6. But you can come whenever you get, get free from work. Okay. All right. Yeah. What's the name of it? Voice of the Martyrs. A voice of the martyrs. Okay. Yeah. Ben's telling us about a movie called Savina, made it by Voice of the Martyrs, and that supported them over the years. Uh, they support people who are dying martyr deaths even in the world today. It shows what Man. Serena or Serena movie dot com. That'd be great. Put it in the bulletin next week. Great. All right. Love you guys. Have a great week.